and hello. Um, this is one of my first screencasts, and what I'd like to do is kind of walk this modern world history course uh, uh, through up through the migration piece uh, using a couple of different things on the slideshow or uh, on my computer. So I'm going to take you through a bunch of different resources that I put together to kind of help you uh, develop these. Um, and some understanding about migration. Now, one of the first things that we have to, uh, to do to consider ideas about uh, migration is understand that people, re only re up until recently, have really been moving around. Um, what we find is that, uh, that prior to the modern world, the real big movers were religious missionaries. Um, traders or people who are in it for basically the commercial wealth and specifically um, people also that had some diplomacy uh, importance, diplomatic importance. So like envoys or people who specifically had some academic skills, generally spoke a language and so what they could do is represent a ruler or the ruler's interest or the nation's or, or some sort of regional interest somewhere else and they became kind of important. There's been all kinds of movies about these people also. You see them throughout, um, you know, there's a movie I remember about a, a Muslim uh, person who became like the envoy to the Vikings. And a lot of this actually took place in a one particular period of history and so we can actually go to that period of history. Um, San Diego State University refers to it as Big Era 5, and you can, as you can see, the movement around people on this particular screen shows uh, all these arrows are actually movements of, of people. In here you have this cyclical movement of, uh, of the Bantu speaking people and they establish these really advanced states in and around uh, the sub-Saharan Africa piece, uh, talking about Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. Mali is the one that we have a tendency to have the, the most kind of information about since they were the ones that was almost like the, the direct, uh, uh, almost golden age of, of, of sub-Saharan Africa. This area in here is actually, we'll see is more like the Indian Ocean, but this is actually a trade route. Up and down the coast here, coastal areas, you'll have some significant cities that still exist today that at one point were thriving cultural and commercial centers. Uh, talking about places like Zanzibar, Mogadishu. Today there's uh, Somali pirates that are around that region. But nevertheless, um, that, re that, that area up and down Africa uh, was really, really critical to this Indian Ocean trade. Um, on this side, that kind of links the two, and you'll really see that like, uh, what really will create the modern world is when you can link all of these specific arrows. So we've got this, this European um, commercial activity here, movement, or what they call regional patterns of unity, movement of ideas, movement of products, a lot of it driven by money. And when that kind of system emerges or converges with this system here is where you begin to see the modern world emerge. This here, this area in Russia, uh, what will eventually become like Muscovite Russia, is really in this period of time dominated by the Mongols. Inside this area here, we have Islamic trade, um, and so um, you know, trade driven by Islam. The, the Arab world, kind of a unity, people unified by their belief structure. Uh, let me go back to that uh, real fast. And I like some, something going on here. Back then. And uh, we feel some significant uh, uh, East Asia, Asian trade. Southeast Asian trade. This Southeast Asian trade is really, really important because uh, what we see is from here, this is where kind of all the other systems want to get to. This becomes the seat of the spice trade. The climate here and uh, uh, can uh, support uh, enormous uh, agricultural growth. Its connectiveness to China makes it really, really critical uh, to the birth of the modern world, and uh, and it really becomes kind of like the the, the almost the center of birth of, uh, of of what the um, the Chinese will consider to be the, uh, places to take its external population or population that we can't support anymore. Out here is something that's really kind of becoming an emerging area in world history is this uh, Polynesian 
uh, movement of Polynesian people across the Pacific. Um, starting, of course, with uh, New Zealand and the Morari people, we'll see that you know over time this becomes like populated. The ability for the peoples here to kind of navigate the water, establish uh, footholds in the different island chains across the Pacific, all the way to Easter Island, which is a kind of a unique story in itself, becomes kind of a um, uh, a really neat kind of way to kind of turn your thinking on its side that the Pacific Ocean is not necessarily an obstacle but can also be considered a way to connect people. So let's keep going here and look at some connections with people. Figure of five, like I said, is this area. Sometimes we call it the post-classical period because it's the period after Rome. Um, every region or what we call landscape regions of, uh, of, of, of the world kind of doing their own thing at this time. But one of the things that mark this period important is a religion, uh, and religion is a connective piece to people. Uh, we've already talked about how we see Africa, Europe, and Asia as kind of one particular landmass, so we refer to it as Afro-Eurasia. And during this time, we will see some of the most extensive or more extensive exchanges of ideas across time and space. So where do we start with that? Well, we're really looking at uh, the concept of migration, which kind of fits in with what we've been doing in class. And as the populations increase, people begin to move out and look for places that can support uh, them uh, from a resource standpoint. There's also, like we said, I already talked about this whole idea of moving your culture from one place to another. So what we do see is, for example, after the Jewish diaspora, we have um, Jewish uh, pockets or enclaves developing in places like China, India, into Southeast Asia, um, and then of course into Europe. So what we see is as people begin to move, migrate, they take their ideas with them, they take their way of life with them. Um, we also begin to see the emergence of very, very large cities during this time period, which is a, a, an extremely uh, uh, important indicator of development. We know cities during this time, we'd like to think the cities were, you know, um, you know, these, these hotbeds of, uh, of culture and, and you would see like, uh, you know, people focused on the cities being very cosmopolitan, but they really weren't. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're here. And so what do we get, take a look at each time? We look at the population change, we look at trade, we look at the development of new ideas. And one of the other characters that's being stick out during the post-classical period is this development of state dominated empires. We see the, the growth of these large scale empires across Afro-Eurasia and also into the Americas. Here we see one of the major forces behind this is the, the creation or the, the growth of, of people. And one of the things that makes the, the um, populations grow substantially is, of course, food supply. Um, and as you can see, there's some really unique things that you can see if you chart through this third and fifth century, we see this, this, this dip in population. It's not too substantial, but we eventually just begin to see it move up and down. And one of the reasons why we see this uh, during this time is because we see um, uh, some, some improvements in medicine, particularly as a result of Islam, uh, the Islamic states, and some of the developments that they did in science. Some of the first doctors and hospitals began to emerge here. So you did see some, uh, some spike in global population as a result. Uh, the spike begins to shoot up uh, massively uh, as a result of uh, exponential growth into the 12th century and then you see this, this huge drop and most uh, historians or most people who are students of history would say that this is as a result of uh, a calamity known as the bubonic plague but it's also uh, also connected to also something event known as the little ice age the little ice age which uh, is a uh, over a period of time um, was this uh, cooling off in afro eurasia which led to diminished crop uh, yields, which would then uh, not necessarily cause people to starve to death, but would not produce enough food for them to be actually uh, as healthy as they could be, which made them susceptible to any sort of germs or bacteria or viruses that could affect them. So as biological agents began to, uh, to move and spread as a result of the Mongols during this period of time, we begin to see actually this spike in people which um, is actually has not is not all negative to be honest with you. It, it also created some some ideological um, uh, backlash as well as human. Um, uh, what I think is kind of interesting is um, 
is a general reinterpretation of human labor uh, when you don't have enough people to work. Okay, so we're going to keep rolling here. Uh, this might be a little bit easier for us to move around. Uh, and here we can see, like for example, this uh, population uh, changes as a result of the American population uh, uh, kind of staying the same throughout, with the world population having these dips. Um, really unique kind of way to look at it. Um, 40 million equals the population of Spain or Colombia today. So we're talking about two huge, uh, less than 40 million people spread over two huge uh, continents just in the Americas alone. Um, one of the major uh, population growths in Africa Eurasia affected the environment as uh, this deforestation uh, development, which began to happen as wood became scarce. Uh, wood was uh, the major fuel uh, for the period of time. Uh, but it began to give way to other areas. Um, as population increases affected the environment, sometimes people got caught up uh, and these large groups began and might, what we began to see is the first large scale migration. This is really where I want to kind of focus some of our attention here. Um, some of the interesting things that you can kind of uh, identify here about this, for example, the Vikings. Uh, I'm going to first say about the Vikings that uh, the Vikings were, were some of the big mover and shakers of this period of time moving all the way to the Americas and trying to establish one of the first permanent settlements in the Americas. Um, the Skralings are the people that you would kind of come to mind here. They were also great distributors of wealth since they would f float these very, very, okay, uh, the Ostrogothic people and the Vandals. And so they are huge, huge um, agents of change during this time period. The Mongols uh, coming out of Asia, uh, the steppe people, as they were called, some of the first, they were uh, very skilled horsemen, very skilled uh, 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 well, basically that's all they did was ride horses for the most part. Um, but uh, what they could do from the horse made them very, very special during this period. Um, through a little bit of organization and leadership, uh, the Mongols were really your first people to kind of utilize the blitzkrieg model that the, the, the Nazis would use during World War II. The complete overwhelming of their, um, of their, um, their enemies uh, from horse. They used a lot of different kind of sneaky tactics that would kind of allow them to kind of be uh, uh, developed. What was nice about the Mongol, what, what really made them uh, successful in this time period is that when they did take over a particular area, they kind of left that area to uh, the people. They could kind of develop as they wished. They just had to pay taxes. And Mongol taxes were steep, yet uh, reasonable enough for, for cities to kind of tolerate them. One of the biggest reasons why we do consider the Mongols to be so effective at this time is because there really wasn't anyone to stop them. Uh, the, the, uh, the, Song, the Song Dynasty was in decline in Europe. India was kind of a mess at this time. It was very, very disjoint. As you'll see, the other groups that are popping up on the map, you see, for example, the Arabs, which were able to connect. Uh, there's some of the great connectors of the period of, of this period, uh, all the way re with their with their their uh, reach, lasting all the way into Indonesia, actually, where today the largest Muslim population in the world is actually found in Indonesia, all the way reaching up into uh, almost the entire Iberian Peninsula, where they were stopped. Uh, in 732 by uh, Frankish uh, uh, troops at the Battle of Tours. Um, down here you have the Bantu speaking people of Africa which Bantu as a root language becomes kind of the, the connective point for many of the sub-Saharan uh, dialects that you see today. There's literally thousands of them. Um, where, whereas Chinese migration, specifically moving in and around um, Southeast Asia into Vietnam, where they established tributary states that uh, the Chinese would send these, these uh, small pockets of its people there and kind of settle and, and be kind of a presence there. So as you see, there's significant uh, amount of movement during this time period, and this is where I would kind of focus my attention and energy uh, is this type of migration through this period because it kind of creates the modern world that you would see today.